So I'm on uh, the, the part of the what's called kind of selection committee for um, figuring out what talks should actually, um, should we present. And um, this year, some of the feedback we got last year in, um, in the US was um, we don't do enough technical, some variation of this, that we don't do enough technical. And you know, we, I think we all love the meta conversations and see case studies of companies that are doing incredible stuff. And most of you here are doing incredible stuff. Um, so we, we decided to kind of do an operations, next generation future. So we got this kind of sidetrack, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, Cornelia is going to be giving a presentation right tomorrow, which I think is going to be amazing. She's going to get mad at me because I keep saying how awesome it's going to be. Um, Damon Edwards. So it's kind of an interesting, um, John Rez in the back, he's going to be giving a next generation operation. So uh, for me, um, about four years ago at, at DevOps Enterprise Summit, I was asked to do a Docker for managers. It was back then, like nobody knew what was going on. Like, what is Docker? How does it work? And and um, and I thought about this, and I, I, sh I probably should have called the next generation infrastructure for managers. Um, it's going to be reasonably technical, so most managers would actually be very annoyed if they heard this. But it is to be a high level of what is the mess right now of a technical infrastructure, and the best I can explain it the way I think about it. Um, so there. Um, and the clicker is not, oh, there we go. Um, you know what, I mean, like, just Google me. I've done a lot of shit. <laughs> um, I mean, so, um, you know, the DevOps handbook I'm pretty proud of. Today I work for a company called SJ Technology. I sold a company to Docker three and a half, four years ago. I was early in ninth in, in its chef, and so, like I said, I've done a lot of things. And I have a lot of presentations, so if you want to hear the longer version of this, go out to my GitHub project that has all my presentations. I only have 30 minutes, so I got a lot of... The only shameless plug in this presentation is, I actually calculated, I've actually authored 10 books. Um, early in my career, I did a lot of IBM Red books. Um, probably most of you don't know what even that means, but um, I've had a couple of books within the last three or four years, but um, only one audible credit. Only one, so. Uh, me and Gene did this. Um, it, was, it just was a labor of love. Um, it's kind of the history of kind of lean and, and all the things that converge into. It's about eight hours audio only, and I, I, I can't say I've been, it was one of the proudest accomplishments. Even creating st startups, this one rates way up there. All right, spoiler alert, all right, sorry. Um, it's Kubernetes and containers. You can leave now. <laughs> I mean, now's your exit. Uh, um, you know, um, so I would say, where of what's past? We're in London, Shakespeare. Um, what's past is prologue. But yeah, I stole some of this actually from a Google presentation at DockerCon, actually. Hey, the other thing, notice I didn't say Docker. I said container, so put that in your head there. Do we get any Docker employees here? Good, awesome. <laughs> I have a lot of stock there, so I gotta be really careful, but I'm really like, kind of pissed at those guys. Um, Kubernetes is a container management system, or Kubernetes is a container management platform, or Kubernetes is a service management platform. So that's the way I kind of grok Kubernetes right now. And this will make a little more sense when I tell you the things I'm not going to cover. <laughs> so this is the in scope. I got 30 minutes. Um, there's a lot of subjects. So I'm going to talk a little about the OCI. Um, and then I'm going to try to put in context what is the container ecosystem. There's an incredible amount of confusion right now when people try to describe uh, containers. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. This is the, the, every enterprise I go to, and even some of the most mature people who have been running Docker, or, or uh, really started with Docker for four years, I asked two questions. First question I ask is, he's laughing. He's the, he's the only one that got the correct answer. <laughs> and there is no correct answer, by the way. Um, I say, what container implementation are you using? And the fun begins. So always the answer is Docker. So I'm like, which, ver which type of Docker? And then they start looking at me weird, like, do I have any credibility? Now I'm scared. He might know something I don't know. And, then, um, and now you get the real fudge stuff where it's like the open source one. I'm like, there is no GitHub Docker Docker. So which one are you using? Let me get back to you. Or, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. It's the um, Docker uh, Community Edition. And so again, like we, uh, and I, I think I appreciate the fact that the word Docker has become like Frisbee or Coke. But it's amazing how many times when I ask these questions, like if you're on OpenShift, well, then it might be Cryo. And we'll, we'll get into all that, right? 
But the bottom line is, it's kind of a mess. And most people, I will tell you, who've been using Docker for a while, because Docker rebranded, and I'll go with this little deeper, to Moby, um, are just gone to the community edition, and that's not open source. Now, it's free, and I'm just not sure that's a long-term strategy. So then I ask the next question, what's your long-term strategy? And even the, the best of the best will say we have no freaking idea of, on their container strategy. And we're waiting. We're going to see what Google does. We're going to see how this all converts. I asked the same set of questions for Kubernetes uh, or orchestration, and you, it's not as ugly, but it's kind of ugly. So I'm going to try to break that down in terms of how I think we should be answering those questions. And then I'll talk about a little about the service mesh and what's going on there, if you've heard of Istio and Envoy, and kind of put that in perspective. And then I think one of the most interesting things going on right now, and again, the, spoil, uh, the um, uh, next slide will, will, um, will tell you a little bit what I feel about this whole system in general. But this is, like, if I'm looking forward, you know, using the hockey metaphor where the puck's going, to me, I think that the Kubernetes API extensibility is the single most interesting thing going on in techni technology-based um, future. Out of scope, I'm not going to go into any intros of Kubernetes and containers, right? Like, there's a billion people who have done that. Um, storage and network are incredibly interesting and important, but I got 30 minutes, <laughs> so I just can't spend a whole lot of time talking about all the, you know, the plug-in architecture. The network world is ugly. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit at the end if I have some time, because there's two camps there, and it's um, a little crazy, you know, just SDN-ish. Um, also, there's a lot of interesting tools. Um, again, not no time. Um, I'm not really going to talk about cloud native computing, and I, I figured that I'm really not going to cover the past. Just I'll talk about some of the passes that are implementing Kubernetes. And, and again, serverless, again, not that any of these are not important. I do think serverless is flanking our industry re relatively fast. Uh, I'll tell you that I think that if Kubernetes keeps up, it might just all unfold under Kubernetes. That's my early guess. But I don't have time to cover serverless here. All right, so in scope, out of scope. So like I said, it is the Wild West right now. It really is. So if you feel like you don't know what's going on, uh, you're in a large group of people who, um, uh, who are running large infrastructure in really large companies that um, really can't successfully answer those questions I ask um, because it's kind of a mess. A um, little bit about the OCI. Basically, you know, Docker originally um, you know, used Linux containers, LXC. Then they wrote something called libcontainer where they, they were evolving, right? They, you got to give Docker incredible credit for like can opening containers and exposing uh, what like only very few companies were using at scale and commodified it for the rest of us. Um, and then um, and at some point when the OCI was created, they basically donated the runtime, which was um, you know, the um, lib container. And, um, and now that is the predominant runtime. It is most of the players that you would be interested in, concerned in, are running uh, run C. Um, there's also a lot of uh, work and a lot of arguing about image specification, and that's owned by um, the OCI as well. So the OCI is a really good place to keep track of where things are going, because like I said, all the, player, all the players that I would consider first-tier players in this game pretty much are running run C um, and, and are, are arguing over image spec. <laughs> um, so, so the container ecosystem, right? So, Instead of us saying Docker all the time, I mean, again, I can appreciate from a brand that like, that's the way you order any type of Coca-Cola. But um, to have a more honest conversation, I would say that we need to kind of break it down into three kind of distinct questions or categories of how we think about the container ecosystem. We, you know, so the question should be, what's your container runtime? Truth is, it's probably going to be run C unless you know, there is, there's one interesting, there's, uh, there's a couple. Again, I, I'm not all-knowing. <laughs> um, like by the time I finish the presentation, there'll be four new products out there. Um, but um, the, you know, run C is pretty much the, what most people have settled on. And then, um, and then the container engine is the one that I think we're mostly going to talk about. And then the question of container orchestration. So I like to think about if we're going to have conversations about container ecosystem, and like I'm totally up to discussion and debate, because this is the Wild West. So if you want to grab me and say, I think it should be coined a different way, or like I'd love to have that conversation. Uh, but I'm going to stick with this one for now. <laughs> um, 
So run C, um, really predominant. I, you know, I wanted to have more than one bullet. So um, rel car is like this Rust based Oracle. I, I don't know. But um, Kata containers is interesting. Again, there's some nice properties about it being very lightweight. Um, there's a buzz around it. Uh, I still think, you know, unless you just want to experiment and stuff like that, you know, I think just um, for all intents and purposes, when we talk about container run, I'm into run C. But when we get into the engine now, we get into a little more interesting conversation, which is, okay, now the question is, what, what engine are you running? And um, now, you know, in Docker, right? But remember, there's three versions of Docker. There's Moby, which isn't really, which is the open source, which is like literally renamed Docker Docker to Moby Moby. Uh, be honest, I don't think many people are running that. There is the community edition, which is again, it's not, it's, you know, it's not open source, but it's free. And it, it has all the properties, you know, it's, and then there's the uh, enterprise edition that you pay for. So, uh, so Docker is really three flavors. And again, I'm amazed how, you know, I wasn't, I already gave away the punchline, but I was going to ask the audience how many people could explain the difference between Moby and Docker. And anybody raised their hand, I was going to ask them to come up here and explain it to the rest of the people. <laughs> so, and those hands just slowly go. And there's Rocket, right, which came out of Core OS, which now is part of, which that makes it even more confusion, uh, because now uh, Red Hat owns Core OS. Um, and then Cryo is interesting because it's part of the uh, container runtime infrastructure that is part of how Kubernetes is designed to run containers. And Cryo is, for the most part, I would put it in the Red Hat bucket, but Google's involved. And it is the kind of competing, um, we don't, so one of the things that happened was, you know, Docker has had a lot of uh, false starts and, you know, and, and one of the things that as they were looking at uh, rebranding kind of Moby as the open source and Docker, like it was a take back the brand uh, positioning. And what it did really is it forced a lot of vendors who would say, oh, we run Docker. You know, now they kind of like have to explain that answer. You know, if you're like some provider and you say, uh, let's take for example OpenShift, nothing wrong with it, OpenShift, like, oh yeah, we run Docker. What's Docker? Have you talked to a Docker sales rep? Well, so it kind of forced uh, um, this um, kind of cryo, which is, you know, a good container runtime. I mean, to be honest with you, container runtimes are not really that interesting. Um, so, and then like I said, I already kind of did this, like to, you need to really understand what Docker is. The open source is called Moby. Um, you know, literally, if you're a branding, if you're using the brand, you're really not allowed to use Docker as a brand representation unless you basically attribute that it is, is a different product than the open source and we just all just run Docker. Um, you know, and there's Community Edition and there's lots of versions of Enterprise Edition and, and it includes a lot of things, right? So if you're all in on Docker, like, you can get all the things. You know, I just wanted to cover the things so there's the, um, you know, there's the cloud-based computer engine, uh, I'm sorry, um, cloud-based container engines, your Amazon ECS, oh, honesty, ECS is, you know, again, no, Amazon does great things, they didn't do their initial container thing well. Um, Azure has done a pretty good job, and Google's like, they didn't have to, like, by the time they got around to do it, like, why would I give you a container without Kubernetes? So GKE is really your kind of distribution there. Um, so like I said, um, Kubernetes is really, um, the dust is settling. It is the orchestration tool. Um, Docker has swarmed, but even Docker kind of gave up because now they, they have a kind of they're bifurcated in that you get Docker with with Kubernetes and Swarm. And why you would ever use both, I have no freaking idea. Um, Swarm was a good product. But they just didn't invest in it the way they should have. Um, same thing sort of with Mesosphere, right? Mesosphere has gone all in on, on Kubernetes. So if I said anyone, Swarm has Kubernetes and uh, the latest release, and so does Mesos, and, and so does Pivotal. And, the, the, and again, I, I know less about that instantiation, but, but it seems like everybody is basically following the Kubernetes lead. So then the question is, this is that second harder question is, okay, what is your uh, orchestration engine? Oh, it's Kubernetes. Okay, which Kubernetes? Right, um, and you know, there's uh, Kelsey Hightower who is the Kubernetes god, uh, amazing guy. Um, you know, he, he has a Git repo called installing uh, Kubernetes the hard way. So I, I've heard a couple of customers now telling me they call it the hard way. So it's just the default distribution. Do you want to roll up your sleeves? Um, and um, now Heptio is interesting because uh, they call it the undistribution. 
So these are two of the, the founders of Heptio are two of the original developers of Kubernetes at Google. And so the, here's one of the problems, because when you get below Heptio, and this is not a negative, it's just something to point out, that OpenShift, Docker, and Mesos are going to sell you an enterprise-ready version of Kubernetes. Buyer beware. That means there's some proprietary foldings into that. There's some things that aren't pure open source. And they're trying to make your life better. Right? And maybe that's what you want. But what the Heptio folks say is that we are going to try to give you um, what we call an undistribution. And we're going to be open source end to end. So we're going to try to do something that's really difficult to do um, and, and try to give you that promise of you know, enterprise ready, what you need to be an enterprise to use Kubernetes, but it's, there's no proprietary kind of enterprise closed functionality. And so, like I said, Docker now supports, I mean, OpenShift, you've got to give OpenShift credit because they've been, they've been running Kubernetes for um, literally early beta. They had put Kubernetes into OpenShift. So they have more burn time at the, if, you're, if you're looking at the enterprise ready um, versions. Um, they, they have a lot of experience running Kubernetes because they've been running it almost four years, I think, three, at least three, probably four. Um, also, I'm a big SDN fan, so they run Open vSwitch. So they actually have, I, in my opinion, best network solution. Uh, but there's a lot of opinionation in their implementation. You know, there's some confusion on what their long-term strategy commitments are. What if you want to use hybrids? You want to use Kubernetes as a service versus OpenShift? Again, I got 30 minutes, but I'd love to have a longer conversation about like this Wild West. Are you going to run OpenShift on all your clouds and on on-prem? So if you're, I, I talked to a lot of analysts. So the, I tell the analysts right now, OpenShift looks really good from an investment point because most of our infrastructure is on-prem. And so, like, if you want, uh, you know, you, you're Red Hat, you already have Enterprise License Red Hat, um, you want to go Kubernetes, this is a safe bet, but it's going to get really ugly when you start experimenting or running, you know, GKS on, uh, or GKE on um, Google and here. And then, you know, the interesting thing is, like, how is that? Good. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm looking at a lot of faces. Give me a nod if, like, okay, good, good. Well, that's a heavy nod over there. Um, so anyway, that, you know, and then, you know, and Docker, like, like, there's some good things on Docker, like, right? you know, Solomon did some great things. He was a brilliant young man. Um, so Docker, you know, and my, the guy who was my chief architect of Soccer Plane of the company that we sold to Docker is the chief architect of the Kubernetes implementation. So I can guarantee you, um, Madhu Venkapalli, like, did it right. This is a guy that wrote ASICS program for the Cat 6K for 10 years, and then was the first committer of Open Daylight, which was the SDN Nasira killer. Right? Like, he is an amazing architect, design, developer. And he did the Docker, all the development for Kubernetes and Istio and the service mesh stuff. Anyway, um, the Kubernetes as a service players. Again, uh, you know, Amazon seems to be like, I don't know if it's on purpose, but the general vibe of EKS is it's still a little short of what we need. Uh, Zer's doing a great job, and of course, you know, if you're going on a Google platform and you're all in on cloud, then right now, probably Kubernetes GKE is probably the best play. All right, service mesh. How many people are like, kind of have, been, we don't, hopefully come up here and explain it, but I won't do that. Um, how many people understand when we talk about containers and service mesh and Istio? Wow, okay, wow. I thought we'd have at least half. Good, well then this is gonna be a good presentation for you. Um, so the service mesh has been introduced um, kind of ongoing. I don't know when they first started talking about Istio. Um, and I'll explain what Istio is in a minute. But the idea is that you're going to have, you know, the service mesh concept has been around forever. But um, when we start talking about Kubernetes, we not only talk about clustering containers, right, which is the first order problem. Then the second order problem is how do these um, containers, um, you know, invoke APIs and services? And if we don't think about that, it's going to be a wild west of this connecting there, this connecting there. So, um, so the service mesh model really is designed to be a layer for service to service communication. Remember, in this context, it's thinking about how you would have uh, pods with containers in them. Let's just say clusters of Kubernetes with containers in them and how they would uh, call other services. Um, and the idea is to have lightweight proxies and um, and then, like, we then start, um, it's like kind of layer seven um, routing and management or data management. And so the service mesh capabilities, this is where it gets interesting, is um, it really starts with observability. 
And although you won't read this in most of the documentation about it, but, but basically what you're seeing is, and I'll talk about the data plane in a minute, and what you're seeing is all egress and, a, and, and ingress traffic basically being analyzed by some service mesh. And so that opens up the ability to have traffic control, service discovery, load balancing, resilience, deployment strategies, blue-green, uh, canarying, whatever, um, security. And then the one thing I left out, too, is like circuit breakers. Although circuit breaker is actually very more specific to the data plane aspect of this. I probably lost about a third of you, but, um, but stay with me. Um, this is uh, um, the, um, the only one I didn't have to get permission to use <laughs> version. There's some other good ones out, but it's Istio architecture. So Istio, right, is Google's implement. So I say Google, I, I think they collaborate with IBM and other, I'm just going to call it Google's implementation of a service mesh for Kubernetes. And, um, and so what it is, is it's um, it very much like SDN, but remember, SDN is more like layer three. This is layer seven type stuff. It's um, a control plane, data plane architecture. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll tell you in a minute, the data plane is pretty clear, uh, but there's a lot of arguments about the control plane and what should be in the control plane or not. So it is still extremely, extremely early in all this stuff. But like, this is how the, um, the, the, um, the cells are starting to form. And so when we talk about STO in the context of this is the Google's implementation of a service mesh, it, there's a data plane and control plane. Um, the data plane basically, like I said, is um, it basically actually, if you read the second bullet, it runs in, as a sidecar model, but which means that in Kubernetes context, it runs as a container that is a proxy. And it then sees all ingress and uh, egress data and then allows you to do all the magical things that you might have to do, uh, service discovery, all those things, right? And then the control plane is then the kind of the control plane of the separation of the meta services that um, kind of configure and the data gets sent up to manage. Um, I will say again, a lot of confusion. Data plane is pretty clear right now. Control plane, um, again, I'm sure somebody at Google would be furious at me right now. Right now, I would very much, con uh, well, all right, let me wait one more slide to get to that. Um, this is the control plane for Istio. It's something called Pilot Mixer and Auth. Um, Pilot um, basically does service discovery. Uh, this, these things called route rules. So you can see the traffic management stuff. Um, destination policy, a lot of policy stuff that you can implement. Um, Mixer is like telemetry, ACLs, whitelists, rate limits, custom metrics, and then auth is basically all your security, you know, CA, TLS, and encryption. Right, so that's the generic service. Um, but here's the thing, right? The real meat is in the proxy. So this is the proxy that we, they, they call it runs as a sidecar model. So it runs as a container in, um, basically in the pod where the other container is. And um, it's layer seven. It was actually developed by Lyft. You know, it's almost like, you know, I, I say this, I say like, in 2000, I don't know when it was originally developed, but imagine in 2007 you said, hey, give me all the money in the world and I want to create the perfect um, proxy, right? Um, and like, that's kind of what Lyft tried to do. I mean, they looked at Nginx and nothing against Nginx, but like they had to design you know, if you look at the traffic patterns and how they've changed over the years, you know, I mean, it used to be 90% north-south and um, most and 10 or 20% east-west, right? That world is now 90%. I, I think Facebook posted three years ago, 97% east-west of their traffic, right? So, like, it, it mandates a different way of thinking about a proxy, and Envoy is that kind of proxy. And I, don't quote me, but it sounds like I've been told that Google is not only replacing the north-south, but their east-west old Apache mod uh, proxies with Envoy. So in other words, right now, Envoy. <laughs> um, and, and back to the data plane, I think personally that you should spend more time thinking about Envoy than, than Istio. But that's an early guess and an early bet. And again, remember, I'm not an oracle here. <laughs> like I might know just a little more than all of you. Right, because it is pretty confusing. I will say that Nginx is not going to step out of the game, so they got what they call Engine Mesh. Um, so that this is their version of a competitor to Envoy that fully fits the Istio model. All right. And again, I, Liz, for people who didn't raise their hand on Service Mesh, you're probably somewhat confused, but at least I've given you a starter point to go research, right? And that's what this is all about. Um, so finally. This is the, what time are we at? So I think I actually will end early. So maybe we have a Q&A, but 204. What was my, I had to end by. 
Six minutes, oh my God, I better hurry up. No, uh, <laughs> the most important point in six minutes, get ready. No, um, all right, um, API extensibility. So some of you might have heard of this as operator framework, or, which actually CoreOS is a great, if you, I was telling somebody this morning, if you want to see the lineage of how you got to here, there was a CoreOS original article about operator frameworks, which really was a way for a core, it was brilliant, CoreOS was trying to address how do you run stateful apps in Kubernetes clusters? So they wrote this kind of, I, I call it a manifesto, they don't, about we need to think about this, 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 and this. Um, there was a second generation of that discussion. Um, Google kind of adapted, and you're now seeing really, the, I think more of the discussion is less about operators, and some people feel that the operator discussion will get more, more into kind of Kubernetes API extensibility. But um, this is Joseph Jacks. He's my oracle when it comes to Kubernetes. I don't have time to tell you why but he seems to know everything that's going on to the minute. And this is a tweet he just put out recently. He said, all complex software delivered as a service or behind the firewall should be implemented as a system, custom Kubernetes API extension controllers. Radical efficiencies abound. I totally agree with this. I think, so here's my radical hat. I think Kubernetes becomes the next Linux. I think that, I don't know when that happens, but I think we're basically just like, and then I think it's like a 10 or 15 year run of a fabric that becomes how we run all our applications. I know this sounds crazy. But if that happens, Google has designed this extensibility API to be at the millisecond level, it's at Google scale. And basically, um, I'm probably not using the words right, but it's sort of an event loop that would listen to every egress, ingress of the API of a Kubernetes cluster at the millisecond level, and you can create your own custom resource controllers and custom resource definitions. And so that's how um, all of the stateful, like the Redis, the Mongos, the Cassandra's, whatever, are gonna start implementing, and already have, and I'll show you a list of, of ones that are migrating towards the, the, the API model, um, how you run stateful applications. But more importantly, it sets the base, like even like you know, Joseph Jackson would say, if you're a work day, like you should basically build your whole infrastructure on Kubernetes API extension. If you believe that this is the foundation, it's like, it's like if you could go back in time and Linux kernel modules, you would describe to you like, oh my God, like, and you knew what was gonna happen over the next 20 years. Like this could be that, and even if we're wrong, I think you should go investigate this and figure out this technology for your organization. Drop the mic, no. <laughs> couple, more, couple more slides. Um, <laughs> So this is a little about the Kubernetes API. Um, you know, if you, you know, um, I will tweet out some uh, references. I forgot to put the reference list in here, but, but like, um, I would definitely do follow the lineage of the CoreOS um, operation uh, framework discussion. And then if you, um, I think the best thing is to Google like Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes custom resource um, controllers or custom resource definitions or API extensibility or um, anyway, this is just, again, a lot of, little banter about the controller, and the thing is, it is a Google scale, right? So Google waited for us all to, my opinion here is Google waited for all to catch up. We're starting to catch up, and now we may start seeing the benefits of what Google has understood a scale that is uncommon to almost everybody else on the planet, and we might see that starting to manifest in, um, you know, around these areas. So, I mean, some of the numbers I've seen about people running and trapping data at scale with this API extensibility is off the chart. I don't have any numbers to state. Um, this is actually, it's a longer list, so I only cut, I cut out all the names that I thought were, you know, ones that almost everybody would recognize. Now this is actually in the operator model, or the operator framework model, but it's the, it's the evolution of what's happening. These are companies that are building on top of Kubernetes APIs to allow you to run stateful implementations of their, um, and so Joseph Jacks tells me, um, it's funny that a 28-year-old person is my oracle to a 59-year-old person, but that's the state of the world. Um, he says that um, this will be coming out soon. It's out there. It's called Kube Builder. So here's the thing, right? Like, right now, if you want to write custom resource um, controllers or what they call CRDs, it's really hard. I mean, really ugly hard. Um, this is the first attempt to make it a little less hard, but still really, really hard. Uh, but this Kube Builder, and the nice thing about this is, if you forgot everything else that I told you to Google, you can start here and Google here, and uh, this will at least set the framework of what, what really probably is going to be the first order driver of this, um, 
this development ecosystem that, um, if Joseph Jacks is right, and I believe him, uh, will be um, the formation of being able to um, sit at a millisecond level in an event loop of everything that happens in a Kubernetes cluster. And if everything runs in a Kubernetes cluster, um, that's probably a pretty nice place to be. I think I'm done. Yep.